Wow, praise the Lord. We have come to the end of the month again. <laughs> but praise God that he has given us the privilege to serve him. And then as we continue to serve, we allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. And then to forget the past. Don't worry about the past, whether you have trophies or whether you have sadness or whether you have problems. Put those in the past and then focus upon the things of God in the future because God is going to move you from now into the future. Don't let Satan hold you back because of some grievances that you had or because of some problem that you had or some mistake that you have made in life. Because why? Because you are called the sons of God. And the sons means sons and daughters. When the Bible talks about sons, the Bible talks also about daughters. It's just like when the Bible talks about the bride of Christ, the Bible also talks about us male. It means that we are also known as the bride of Christ. So when the Bible says sons, it means that you are included, all the sisters, you are included. Today we want to talk about the sons of the grace of God. Now, one name that comes out in the Bible, the very first name was, of course, in Genesis 1.1, the name of God called Elohim. So in the beginning, God or Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Elohim is a word in the plural, which means like telling you that there's like Trinity, there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in the Holy Godhead. That's why God can say, let us make man, let us. So he's talking, God the Father talking to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. So that's the name we encounter when we read the Bible, Elohim. Now then later on, we find that God began to reveal to him as God Almighty, or in the Hebrew, it's called Al Shaddai. So many of you, you have sung songs about Al Shaddai, and that was a time when Abraham was called by God from the earth of Chaldi, and that's in Kuwait. He called him, the Lord called him all the way to Canaan land. And so when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am Al Shaddai. All right, walk before me and be blameless. What God was trying to tell him was that your future is in my hand and I am mighty to save and I'm mighty to direct you, I'm mighty to guide you. And today the Lord is saying to all of us that he is the Al Shaddai of our life. And then later on when Moses was in the desert and one day he had, you know, he had uh, escaped from Egypt because he murdered some Egyptian. And then he was in the wilderness uh, staying uh, with his new family, the Midianites, and he was there for like 40 years. And then God appeared to him. At that time, he was already 80 years old, but a very strong and robust 80 years old. And so God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus, you shall say to the children, I am has sent me to you. And the Hebrew word, I am who I am, is sound like Yahweh. And so, from that point on, you find the Bible began to talk about Yahweh, or for us, we say Jehovah. And so, other names of God would be like El Elyon, which is the time when Abraham, you know, his nephew was being uh, kidnapped. His nephew was taken by the armies. And then what he did was that Abraham raised an army and went after the enemy and got his uh, nephew back. And so God revealed himself as the God most high or the most high God. And then Al Olam also revealed to Abraham, say, I'm the everlasting God. And then you find that Yahweh is also known as Adonai, which means Lord. So you find that because of respect, they dare not call God by his name Yahweh. And so they call him Adonai. And then subsequently, God revealed himself in many names and to tell you that he cares. And so you've got Jehovah, Ra'ah, which means the Lord my shepherd, 
or Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals, and Jehovah Shama, the Lord is there. And then you have Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my banner, and Jehovah Astikanu, uh, the Lord our righteousness, and Jehovah Makodesh Kem, and the, the Lord who sanctifies you, and Jehovah Jireh, which you know that song called Jehovah Jireh a lot. All right, so the Lord will provide Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is my peace, and Jehovah Sabaoth, which means the Lord of hosts. So all these names, they were there for us to consider. But you find that from Elohim to Al Shaddai to Yahweh and to other names, that one name that's above all names is that title called Father. Father. That Father, that title Father, only we Christian, we are calling him. Because throughout centuries, you find that the ancient Israelites, they recognized God, he was the creator, and he was their father, but they never called him father. And who called him father? It was Jesus. When Jesus came, he was the first to introduce to us our father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because we are followers of Jesus, therefore, we call God our Father. And so, and because you are sons, the Bible says, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father. I want you to recognize that Abba is that Hebrew word or the Aramic word for daddy. It's not called father. So, for example, when I was young, when I got frightened, I don't call father. I call daddy. All right? I call papa. <laughs> right? I never use Chinese term called fu ching. Ching ni guo lai. I do not use that. All right? When I was frightened, I would say, papa. And then my daddy would run to me because I was frightened. All right, there might be a dog trying to bite me. And I say, Baba, all right? So, but you never say, Father, dog biteth me. <laughs> you don't say that. <laughs> you don't become so formal. You call daddy. That's why you find, strangely, in the Greek Bible, they maintain this Aramic word, Abba. They didn't translate it. So in all your translation, you will find Abba, Father. To explain to you, because some of the people who were Gentiles may not understand the meaning of Abba in Aramaic. And then he says, who can be the sons of God? Let me tell you, not everybody, not everybody is the son or the daughter of God. The Bible says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. These are the sons of God. You know why you call led by the Spirit of God? When you are being led by somebody, which means that you have to be obedient. Isn't that true? Somebody say, follow me, and you say, can't be bothered, and then that's why you are in disobedience. Therefore, you cannot be known as the sons of God or the daughter of God, right? So let me tell you that to be a son or a daughter of God, you need to know obedience. Obedience is the key. Throughout the Bible, it's not just about blood relationship. It's not just about your inheritance. It's not just about your ancestor. There was a time when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees was very proud and said, we are sons of Abraham. And Jesus said, no, you are not. You are son of the devil. Why did Jesus say you are a son of the devil? Because these people were living in disobedience. And so Jesus said that, you know, that even from the stone that God can raise up children of Abraham. Can you see? So if you really, you are really a believer, you are really a child of God, you are really a son or a daughter of God, then you are led by the Spirit. 
you are led by the Spirit and you follow the Spirit. And that's why as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. That's why we don't say everybody is a child of God. We don't say that. Just because you are born to this earth means that you are a child of God. No, you are not. You might be created in, by, by God and created in His image, though that image was tarnished. But then you see, to be a son or a daughter of God, you need to be led by the Spirit. And so, let's talk about the sons of God because some people have this misunderstanding that sons of God would be, that term would be very common. Now, we find that son of God are found in the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 6. It says, when human beings began to increase in number on earth and daughters were born to them, right? The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Now, these sons of God, many people thought that they were angels. But you see, what happened here is that I want you to understand that even though angels were also known as sons of God, but then in this context, it's talking about human beings because angels do not reproduce. Angels do not have the, the, the ability of humankind. And so you find, it says, sons of God basically is talking about descendant of Seth. You remember that you got Cain and Abel. When Cain killed Abel, then God gave to Adam and Eve another son called Seth. And the descendant of Seth were known as worshippers of God. They were known as being led by the Spirit. So they were known as the sons of God. And then the daughter of man were the descendants of Cain. And Cain that time was evil. And therefore, that evil streak continued on throughout his, uh, you know, all the descendants. And so you find that there was this intermarriage. But the book of Enoch, which came much later, said that the son of God were angels, but we rejected that idea. And then the Lord said, in the very next sentence, he talked about human being, right? He said that my spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. And so that in this verse, it tells us that God has set a barrier. God has set a limit. God has set a finality of life for us that we do not live beyond 120. Some, very rarely, somebody will live up to 140. Very rare. But you will find that those who live 120, you will say that they are very, very old. I am like halfway there, all right? I just got my birthday, so I'm halfway there. Okay. So, yeah. It says that, what do you mean my spirit will not contend or my spirit will not strive with human being? It means this way. Because even as you breathe in and breathe out, now try breathing in and breathe out. Now that breathing in, it was that first breath that God gave to Adam. And that breath that God gave to Adam continued to be with us. And one day, God will take back this breath. And so that's what God is saying is that that breath that I give you, all right, one day I'm going to take back. But this time, I'm not going to take back, you know, until you are like, 900 years old, I'm going to take back when you are about 120 years old. And then he went on to say the Nephilim, which means the giants were on the earth in those days and also afterward. Why? He say when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them, they were the heroes of old and men of renown. So you are talking about human being here, right? He says that they were the heroes of old men of renown, which means that these were actually human beings. And so there was a mutation because the, the, the men who came from the tribe of Seth then began to be uh, affected by the beautiful uh, young ladies of the descendants of uh, Cain. And so there was a mutation. But what happened here is that we are going to talk about us, that we are the son of God. So Romans 8.15 also say, for we did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cried out, Abba, Father. 
So for all of us who are Gentiles, who are non-Jewish, uh, right, so that we have been adopted and praise God for this adoption. And this adoption is such that if you understand the Greek value of uh, the Greek understanding of adoption means that you have exact rights as those who are being born in the household. Once you are being adopted, you have the same rights. And so we can also call Daddy God. We can also call Abba Father. <clears throat> now I'll talk to you about the son of the kingdom. How great are you? How powerful are you? How dignified are you? You see, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist, which means that anybody that's before John the Baptist, they were not as great as John the Baptist. Means Moses wasn't as great, and then Elijah wasn't as great, and all the other prophets, you can name them, Isaiah, Jeremiah, you know, Ezekiel, and so on and so forth. All the great men and great heroes of faith. They were not as great as John the Baptist. Why was John the Baptist great? Because he was the forerunner of the Messiah. He was appointed by God to be the one who could see the Messiah. Remember, he was a cousin. He was a cousin of Jesus. He was six months older. And during the time when Mary came to his mother, Elizabeth, you know, John the Baptist in the womb of his mother began to leap with joy. Why? Because he was already filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. And he already recognized who that baby in his auntie's womb, all right, in Mary's womb. And so you see, in the spiritual world, you find that there would be this correlation and there would be this kind of a special link and the connection that will thrill us. We don't know what is happening in this invisible world. We don't know what is happening in the spiritual world. But Jesus said, John the Baptist, because he declared, behold the Lamb of God. And therefore, you, Jesus said that this man, all right, this cousin of mine, that he was the greatest of all who were born of women. Then he ate a bombshell, boom. And he said, yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. You know, who are those who are least in the kingdom of heaven? You and I. Give the Lord a clap offering, praise God. Really clap our love. Because... We look at ourselves and we say, we are nobody. He say, yes, you are least in the kingdom. You are nobody. But in the sight of God, you are somebody. It's like the servant who worked in the household for 30 years and he remained a servant. But when a baby is born and that baby is the heir of the family and that baby is the only son, you know what happened? That baby, though helpless, becomes the apple of everybody's eye. Like that is the focus. And that's what God is saying to you, is that you become great, not because of how handsome you look or how beautiful you look or how smart you are, but because of your status. You are born into the kingdom. You are called born again. That's why don't despise your birth. Don't despise your uh, status. Don't despise your identity. You know who you are. So you are the heir of God, the Bible says. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And therefore, what happened here is that behave like a son. Don't behave like a slave. You know, there's a Chinese word used. It's uh, called uai zai. You know, some people wake up and you're, oh, yeah, I see them, I see them. Oh, yeah, today I see them, I see them. Nothing but I see them. You know, maybe you should change the name to I see them. <laughs> right? Because... Why? Because the person cannot see that he is a child of God. He is a son of God. He is the heir of the kingdom. So I want to talk to you about the grace of God. The grace of God upon mankind and the grace upon sons and daughters of God. See, grace for the common good is for everybody. He says, he made grass grow for the cattle and plants for men to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth. That's the grace of God. So God allowed the system, the ecosystem in our world to continue so that we can survive. And then God says, and Jesus said to us, He said, 
But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be what? Everybody reads, sons of your Father in heaven. How do I know I'm the son of my Father in heaven? This is what I do. I forgive my enemy. I bless those who curse me. It's not possible. I tell you, I naturally want to kill them. I naturally want to slit their throat. I naturally want to strangle them because they treat me badly. That is my, my nature because I used to belong to Satan. Can you see? All right. But now because I'm being born again and therefore I have a different nature. And that's why if I don't display that nature, I question my identity. Is my nature really born again? If I continue to be spiteful, if I continue to, uh, you know, spread all kinds of rumors and lies, I continue to talk bad about people, then what happened here? I may not be sons of the Father in heaven. So you see, what did Jesus say? He said, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and send rain on the just and on the unjust. So God in his grace continue to provide. God in his grace continue to provide for both good and evil. Grace for the common good. But it comes to us now is that the, the, this is called the prevenient grace or what we call grace of prevenience. Yeah? It's something done beforehand in anticipation of a later situation, which means that God has given you grace before you were saved. Pastor Grace here, <laughs> Pastor Grace can tell you that when she was young, when she was not even a Christian, that God was actually placing his hand upon her life. And that somehow in her heart, she knew. I knew too, all right, that even though I was that time praying to Kunyam, all right, but I knew that there, would, there was some, this, this, this person who cares about me. And so later on, when I met the Lord, and then I gave my life to him. And so this is called the prevenient grace or grace of prevenient. So no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on, uh, at the last of days. So Jesus is actually drawing you. Some of you here, you may not be really Christian yet, but Jesus has brought you here to this church because he's drawing you. And so the grace of predestination of foreknowledge. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. You know why he chose us? Is because he got this foreknowledge that you would respond. He chose you because today he knows that you are in this church. He knows that you are in the Zoom. You are on Facebook. Because why? Because you desire to worship him. So you find that Predestination is not that he predestined you so that you have no choice, but rather because he is the God of the past, the present, and the future. He was already in the future. He has seen the end of the movie, and he knew exactly how you would respond. And that's why from the very be beginning, he says that he chose us because he knew how you would respond. Can you see that? So those of you who watch movie, you say, uh, this is a spoiler, you know. I'm going to tell you the end of the story. So don't tell you the end of the story. But the Bible tells you the end of the story, right? That the Lord will raise all of us up. And then he says, in love, he predestined us. That is what Paul said. He predestined us to be adopted as his son through Jesus Christ in accordance with what? His pleasure. Did you know that when God chose us, he got pleasure? And his will is that he wasn't forced to have us, but he just loved you. How many of you, when you have your baby, you say, oh, I don't want this baby. But you want. Before, maybe you say, I don't want to have baby. But then suddenly you have your baby. Then would you want to give your baby away? No, no way you want your baby. Because your baby gives you pleasure. Of course, some baby give you pressure, but, but pleasure would be more. And so to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us, given us in the one he loved. 
So what happened here is that even becoming a child of God is by the grace of God. It's not that we actually make that choice, but His grace surround us, you know, and then like bring us into that ranch and so that we can be fed and we can be uh, protected by the rangers. So this is what grace is all about. Grace surrounds you and grace brings you into the presence and the protection of God. Then there's a grace of response. Because after the good news is, uh, was preached, you know, why did you respond? It's because that there was the stirring in your heart. The Holy Spirit continued to speak to you even though you didn't know the Holy Spirit. So all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruits and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day. Since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. And so you have encountered grace from beginning to the end. And so now you come to salvation. It's called the grace of justification. There is no difference between Jewish people and the Gentiles, all right, people like us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So God is holding everybody accountable, whether your ancestry would be at uh, this Abraham or you'll be like us, will be Adam. And then you, you, you find God is holding all of us accountable and then are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. So I'm saying to you this one truth here. If you are trying to earn your salvation, you are trying to be a good boy or a good girl, you find that you fail God. And every time you fail God, the devil is going to come and whisper to you that you fail God. Right? He's going to put that guilt feeling. And so many of you Christians are living in, under this guilt. Why? It's because you don't understand the power of grace. The power of grace is such that he, the power of grace can even overcome all your mistakes and all your wrongdoing and plus your sin. That when you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, 1 John one nine. So you find that this is the truth here. So don't live under condemnation or under guilt right now. So justification by faith means what? You are no longer defined by your sin. You are no longer defined by your mistakes. You are no longer defined by your illness. You are no longer defined by your depravities. You are no longer defined by your past. No matter how much evil things you had done in the past, you are forgiven. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't die just on the cross for you. He died on the cross as you. You die on the cross. As you die on the cross, as you are being sacrificed. So that's why you are justified. Because he died as you. Therefore, you are justified. Nobody can condemn you. You have made a lot of mistakes in the past. Oh yes, maybe you have been on drugs or maybe you have stolen or maybe you have committed adultery or maybe you have done a lot of bad things in the past or cheated people or in the scam job and so on and so forth. But I tell you, the very moment you come to Jesus and you accept Him, that He died on the cross as you, you are being justified. And that's why the world cannot accept it. But that is the truth of the gospel. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to know something here. That many of us got this thing wrong is that salvation is for us only. Oh, we, we are now saved, we go to heaven. That is not the main thing. That is the side effect. Going to heaven is a side effect. And then... Being blessed right now is a side effect, all right? That all the blessing of the kingdom come upon you is only side effect. The most important thing is this, is peace with God because there is enmity between you and God. God is angry with you and God cannot allow you to enter heaven because you are tarnished, you are dirty, you are filthy, all right? So God has His law. But because Jesus, He paid the price, then God opened up heaven. And therefore, there's peace with God. 
Therefore, the whole thing about Jesus, what was he trying uh, to teach you? He's not trying to teach you, oh, now you get saved already, you're very happy, you're going to heaven. No, he's trying to teach you to be reconciled with the Father. Every time he say the Father, the Father, the Father. Because when you come to know Jesus, you should know the Father. That's why he say what? Our Father who art in heaven. He didn't just say, heaven, here I come. Right? He said, our Father who art in heaven. Because why? Now this relationship between God and you being reestablished because you were living in sin. Therefore, there's peace with God. Very important. If you don't know the God, the Father, you have missed out completely. You don't understand what Christianity is all about. You think Christianity is about you. Oh, I, I, it's all about me. Nope. It's not about you. It's about the Father. Because the Father created you, the Father loved you, and, but the Father was angry with you because you were in sin. A price got to be paid. And then the Father's love for you created the grace that sent Jesus Christ to you and then Jesus died on the cross as you. And therefore, you have no need to die and then hell must close its door and then heaven must open its door. So, you are standing in grace. Though whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Let me explain. Through whom also we have had our access. The whole thing is about in perfect tense, which means that we have already have access into the grace of God. The day that you give your life to Jesus Christ, you already have had. All right, you've been born again. Right? So we have access to God's grace and now we continue to remain in His grace. Daily is grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. Because daily we make, we create offense. We have mistakes. We have sin. We have lustful thought. We have evil thought. We have bitterness. We have all kinds of devious thought. And then we need to hand over. That's why the handing over prayer is so important. You hand over to the Lord. You hand over. The very moment you hand over, you hand into His grace. You are never handing into His judgment. He will not judge you because the judgment has been done. All right? In Christ. Christ died for you. Now you just hand over into His grace. And grace into this grace means this state of acceptance and favor with God, the fruits of justification. That because you are being justified, you continue to remain in the zone of grace. So, continue, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. So we are not boasting about our effort or our merit. We boast about the absolute confidence that we have of our future, and that is in the hope of the glory of God, which means that that justification day, when the Lord say, no sin, no crime, you are acquitted, all right? That day is already being experienced now because God moved that day, that experience to your very present experience. You are now acquitted. And that's why that glory of God is now part of your life. That when we sing glorified your name, what are we singing about? Means that let my life magnify your name. Let my life be in line with the promise that you have for me. Let my life show people who God is. That is called glorifying your name. But if I gossip, I backbite, I continue to go back to my sin, then I am not glorifying God. So when you glorify God, you show yourself as a son of God. You show the grace of God, uh, you know, overflowing out of your life. And so, we move on to the grace of salvation. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Why? Because faith is the ability to accept that grace. Grace can be given. Grace is a gift to you. But you, faith is the hand. Faith must be stretched out to receive grace. If you don't stretch out by faith, 
there is no grace for you. It's not that why people who are not saved, some people in the world say, God, why you created me here and put me in hell? God said, I didn't. I created you here. You sin, you go to hell. But I give you grace. Would you accept? Then you put your hand behind and say, I don't care. Then you go to hell. Because why? Because you have not, have, you're not led by the Spirit of God. So, and this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. Some people like to boast and say, you know why I go to heaven? Because I'm so good. You know why I go to heaven? Because I have opened three orphanages. You know why I'm so good? You know, all this boasting about, all this you had to put into the rubbish heap, and then you depend solely and solely on the grace of God. Then you can be saved. And then after you are being saved, then what happened is sanctification. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify for the purifying of the flesh. So he's talking about the Old Testament time when Moses implemented the law and said that you have to have this law of sacrifice. And you sacrifice the animal in your place. Take your place. All right, and then you are being sanctified. Okay, you have sinned against God, but then you bring the animal there, you sacrifice the animal, so the animal died and you don't have to die. You don't have to pay the price. All right, then what did the writer of Hebrews say? How much more shall the blood of Jesus, the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So it's telling you here is that, wow, this eternal spirit has offered, all right, Jesus Christ and that he's without spot. And therefore, whatever cleansing that now you experience is eternal. It's not going to be just temporal. It's eternal. That's why I am blessed. I'm blessed that because, you know what? I know that I'm cleansed. But then you say, but pastor, what happened if I... Uh, if I told a lie, what happened if I scold people and all that? There's always that way out. Because you are not condemned by those things. Because God has put you into a place called grace. Whereby you can confess to God and say, I'm sorry. It's like this. Once the child is in your family. For example, now you have a grandchild. Many of you are very old. So we talk about grandchild. All right. So, so you have a grandchild. The grandchild come to visit you. And then the grandchild make a mistake. What must you do? You kick him out of the house, right? He's only five years old. So he stole some cookies from your jar. All right, so you get very upset. You say, who uh, steal the cookie? And then the grandchild point at the dog and said, that the dog did it. <laughs> and then you say, not only stealing, you are lying. So because you're so naughty, I'm going to chase you out of the house. Is that? Of course not. You'll be crazy. Right? They don't say the grandchild is crazy. They say you are crazy. How can for the cookies and you chase the grandchild out of the house? No way. Same with God. God is going to, not going to chase you out of the house because you make a mistake, because you sin, but that He give you a way to repent. He give you a way to reconcile. Alright? And so this is the way God works. And then... Grace of provision. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Remember that when you use the word being born again, what is being born again in the Greek? It means born from above. Okay? Born again means born from above. So he's saying uh, that every good gift is from above, means from God, and coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. Why did he say that the Father is of the heavenly lights? Because everything that God gives you will shine forth into your life and bring illumination to every dark corners of your life. All the good gift is to bless you and that your good gift will to bless others. Because God will never curse you and God will never put darkness into your life. And so, who does not change like the shifting shadow, you find that in the heavens or in the sky, there are stars and there are all the planets and so on and so forth, you know. But they have shadows and they are shifting and moving and so on. But for God, it's not. His light is consistent and He keeps coming, He keeps coming, He keeps coming. You know why? Because He loves you. He loves you so much. Some of you still haven't got this idea yet. 
You still haven't got this idea. Like, you know, you are still, your eyes still very dull. You know, if I see this thing, oh, ah, you got it. You got this idea. And I caught it. I caught it a long time ago. I said, wow, God, you really love me. <laughs> yes, God said, I love you. Okay? And so, then He gave you the grace of empowerment. Because He loved His children, He gave them different gifts. He said, we have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion of his faith. And then Paul went on to talk about the varying gifts. You know that all the gifts that God gives to you, except for the gift of tongues, the gift of tongues is for yourself to edify yourself so that you can grow in the Lord. And so I encourage you to speak in tongues and pray in tongues. But all the other gifts are meant for others. Gifts are not just meant for yourself, but meant for others. But as you allow the gift to flow to others, that the blessing of God will also touch you. Amazing, amazing. You know, it was that when I was not healed yet, and I was healing others, continue to heal others, command healing, command healing. And my back was still so painful, especially at one time I remember one man who had a chronic back pain. As I lay my hands upon him, he was healed. And so I said, God, not fair. I still got back pain. He got healed, right? But God said, wait. Because God, He was testing me and God is testing you. Some of you here, God is testing you whether you're faithful or not. For example, when you don't have a lot of money, but you're still blessing people who are poorer than you. And then one day, that blessing would come. That financial freedom would come. Because God is testing you. And so, God wants to empower you to be a blessing for others. And then there's a grace of service or grace of servanthood. And each one should use whatever gift he has received. See? To what? Serve others. Faithfully administering God's grace in its various form. So now suddenly you realize that the gift, the charismata, the gift comes from grace, charis. All right? The Greek word for Gift is charismata, and then it comes from that word called charis, which means grace. So what you are doing is that every time when you use your gift to bless others, for example, you are called to be a teacher, and you are willing to teach the Bible. You study the Bible, and then you study it so deeply, and then you are able to impart, you are able to teach. And so what happened here, the charis, all right? The charis become charismata. When it's released, it becomes charis. Can you see? So it began to touch people. Are you releasing charis to people? Are you releasing, uh, uh, you know, giving people the gracelets? This is the grace of God. But whatever come up become the gracelets and touch the life of people. And that's what Christianity is all about, is to bless others in its various forms. And now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and mir miraculous signs among the people. Now Stephen was just a deacon. He was not an apostle, but because of the grace of God. He's like full of God's grace and power. And what happened? He did wonders. Today, Pastor Grace and I, we are able to heal the sick. Why? It's because of the grace of God. And many of you can do great miracles because of the grace of God. So understand there's a grace of miracle for the sons and daughters of grace. And so the next one is grace of sustaining. That by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace to me is not without effect. No, I work harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. So you find that here Paul was talking about that grace of service, that grace of servanthood, is that even as I serve, that many people are so afraid to serve. You know why? Because I might lose something, or I might lose some money, or I might lose my effort, or I might get tired. And so we do the minimum for the kingdom of God. But Paul said, no, I am doing everything, right? And His grace to me is not without effect because it's stirring me up because I'm now connected to the God of grace. And so that grace is coming and I work harder than anybody else, than all of them. Yet not I. Why? Because the grace of God is flowing through to me. And that's why I serve. I just told a brother, I am not retiring. I'm 68. 
uh, last Friday, but I'm not retiring. Why? Because of the grace of God. As long as the Lord allow me to stand and share and give me a good, good brain and so that I can, I can study and then give me a heart that's full of the Holy Spirit, I will continue to serve. It's called the grace of sustenance. And then very quickly to the grace of encouragement because along the way, the devil is going to attack you. One of the ways of attack is discouragement, right? It's going to discourage you. And so that some people leave the church because after a while, they got discouraged. Why? Because what? Because uh, nobody appreciates me. You know, I served here for one year. Pastor never even said a word, thank you. So I'm leaving the church because no thank you. But they forgot the birthday card I sent to you. <laughs> they forgot, <laughs> right? You received my birthday card. <laughs> All, right. All right, so it says that, so God told him, my grace is sufficient for you. Because why? Because Paul was suffering from a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what's that thorn in the flesh, but that it was something from Satan. He says that God allowed Satan to buffet him with something most probably painful. And so, whereby Paul said that, you know, I asked the Lord to take this away many times, yeah? But the Lord says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness, means your weakness. Therefore, Paul said, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. This is the most mature Christian. I tell you, that he was in prison, he was tortured, he was whipped, he, all the bad things that could ever happen to anybody happened to him. But yet he said that he will boast all the more gladly about his weaknesses, about his pain, about his brokenness, about his struggle. Some of us, we prick one finger only, we don't want to come to church already. God, why you allow my finger to be pricked? God, why are you like that? Why didn't you stop the needle as it come? It's my stop. You see, we had, we had all kinds of ideas and requirements. But God wants to encourage you is that whatever happened, His grace is sufficient for you. And then the final one is that, therefore, this got the grace of eternal promise. Therefore, the promise come by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. Not only those who are of the law, but those who are of the faith of Abraham. So here now is the grace of eternal promise. He promised you, as long as you are the sons and daughters of God because of your obedience, then eternity will be your portion. Today, if you go out there and something happened, or last night, if you were to die, last night something happened, I assure you this morning, you will be in the presence of God. Your soul and your spirit will be in the presence of God. And that's what the Word of God says so. So let's conclude and see what we have learned. We, we have learned about the grace of the, for the common goods. We learn about grace of prevenient. We learn about the grace of foreknowledge or predestination, grace of respond whereby you are led to respond, grace of justification where Christ died in your place, and then grace of salvation where you are saved from the fiery hell, and then grace of sanctification where you are purified to become true sons of God, and then grace of empowerment that you can use that to serve in the grace of servanthood. And then Grace of miracles, which means that as you walk with the Lord, the power of grace will be with you. You can touch people for Christ. Grace, grace of sustaining, He sustains you. He encourages you. And then most importantly, at the end of your life, He welcomes you, all right, into the eternal rest.